here's an idea. You are a digital squirrel. You've fallen down the Wikipedia rabbit hole. We all have. You hop on for a second to look up something about suspension bridges, and suddenly you're on a page about wet t-shirt contests. It's interesting, but it's kind of weird and is completely unrelated to what you actually wanted to learn about. Most concerningly, you have no idea how or why you got there. Well, I'll tell you why. You're a squirrel. Well, you're not literally a squirrel, but you're certainly acting like one. Acting like a squirrel looking for some tasty noms. You are foraging. But what is foraging? Foraging is searching for a resource, generally food. Everyone's got to eat, but the question is where and how far and for how long? Any given squirrel embarking from their cozy nest has to make some decision about how far from home they're willing to go and what food they're willing to travel to. What if there aren't any acorns in that tree? What if they taste bad? What if the tree's near a hungry dog? And how does this all compare to, say, leftover bread scraps from a recent picnic under the tree? Ecologists model these risks to predict what the squirrel will do and where it will go. The squirrel's brain will weigh all it knows about how far the acorns are, where predators might be, how the acorns taste, and other risks and rewards. It would consider everything and ultimately decide to eat whatever will give it the most bang for its buck. This is optimal foraging theory. Squirrels don't have sophisticated algorithms like ecologists do, at least not formalized ones, even if they often line up with foraging models like Eric Charnoff's marginal value theorem. They aren't omniscient, they can't plan a perfect route, instead they end up bouncing from tree to tree, learning as they go. By doing so, our squirrel is finding information. For the foraging squirrel, information about the food around it refers to the cost of getting food and the benefit of eating it. So as the squirrel forages, it learns about the places and things it searches. This helps the squirrel make better decisions about what, where, and when it eats. In their book, The Distracted Mind, Ancient Brains in a High-Tech World, authors Adam Ghazali and Larry D. Rosen say that humans forage for information the same way they used to forage for berries back in prehistoric times. Because foraging for food involves so much information, the parts of your brain that control food foraging are linked to information foraging. Both actions enable you to answer your questions about the world. Information informs, so anything that can answer a question and in the process reduce uncertainty fits the bill. Anything that fully answers one binary question is what we call a bit, which is the smallest unit of information. Briefly diving into terminology here, what actually is uncertainty and what do we mean by bits? Uncertainty is a property of the observer, not of the world, as in you, the observer, are uncertain about a thing. A bit is the answer to a question. If you asked a question and got an answer, you got a bit. A bit smarter. Moving on. A bit could be the answer to any question. Is the president of France currently in Paris? Does Michael Jordan enjoy playing baseball? It can be about the store you shop at or the wireless router you're trying to fix. Anything. To reduce uncertainty, then, means to change how accurately we can model or predict something. Unless you're wrong, of course. A, a bit can also answer a question wrong. Lots of information in the world is misleading or incomplete, which is why we go through so much trouble to gather more of it. Okay, back to Wikipedia. It's a massive knowledge center with information on just about any topic you can think of. When you define information, it's a fast and approachable way to do so. But Wikipedia is also chock full of those alluring blue links that lead you from suspension bridge to wet t-shirt contest. You've gotten on Wikipedia to find quick, easy information about suspension bridges. So why did you get so distracted? Because it feels good to find all that information. Millions of years of evolution have trained your brain to enjoy gathering information. You're hardwired to consume as much as possible, even if it slows progressing towards your original wiki search goal. This can be used to intentionally monetize your attention, like with YouTube, which profits off of providing you with delicious recommendations. Remember, food foraging and info foraging are wired the same way in your brain. So gathering a lot of information feels good, even when it's not benefiting you. Just like how eating junk food tastes good, but is terrible for you. Every time you click on a listicle or scroll through Facebook, you may feel a sense of accomplishment, despite the fruitlessness of your labor. This good feeling about information wasn't a problem when information was hard to find. Similarly, our lug of sugars and sweets was not a problem in the wild, even though nowadays it can lead you to eating a whole box of Oreos in one sitting. When you had to directly observe something, or hear a fact from another person, or even find it in a physical book, it took a lot longer to find information. It's not really the case in the instant gratification information economy of the internet. So foraging for information is born out of the same patterns as foraging for food. When you're browsing through Wikipedia, you're activating your brain in the same way as your hunter-gatherer ancestors. Today we often come across information unexpectedly, like stumbling on an article about glands and ants or the demon core. But for most of human existence, information wasn't so context independent. Facts like this tree is large, Batman is awesome, or Pam is really passive aggressive. 
could only be discovered by directly observing and interacting with these people and places, or with someone who had. There were no archives, no newspapers, no minstrels, no tweets, and no subscription feeds. If someone told you about a tree and you bothered to remember, it was probably because you visited that tree yourself and discovered some good fruit. However, now we have context-independent information as well. And just like a foraging squirrel, we don't want to waste effort. We don't want to bumble around worthless websites, either because they have nothing for us, or because what they do have is incomprehensible. So as we browse the web, we weigh the costs of staying in a website or jumping off to another. We also weigh information about the places we're searching in, information about the information we're foraging for. You could call it meta-information. Based on this meta-information, we might decide to regularly visit certain sites until it's part of our routine. A website can make the whitelist for many reasons. Information density is certainly one factor, but getting information that's new to, or at first relevant, is equally important. We see this with Google. It's such a universally acknowledged source of good info that Googling something is just a part of our language. If you like a site enough, you might pay for a subscription to remove ads, improving your experience. Plus, by putting resources into this information producer, we hope to get even more of those sweet, sweet information tidbits. If this sounds a little familiar, that's because it is. It's cultivation. It's a farm. We are cultivating information. In this scenario, a website is like a food patch. The food we're growing is knowledge on different but related topics. We don't need to leave the food patch because more food, those related topics, is always just a short step away. This is how Wikipedia gets so full of those delicious blue links. We cultivated it so much, each page is stuffed with easy access to more information. As information foragers, we've been visiting Wikipedia for a long time by now. We know the dangers of the infinite links, but we also know how good the information there can be. We might even be actively trying to make the weaknesses in our information crop smaller, either through donations or by editing articles ourselves. This makes Wikipedia a better place for everybody and thereby creates a positive feedback loop. We go on Wikipedia because we know it's good and we actively make it better. This makes it extremely easy to say, hey, I want to learn about the Mesozoic era. Let's just go to Wikipedia. But there is a flaw. How often do you actually click on any of the citations on Wikipedia? If you're like me, probably not very often. It's comfortable to return to a site you like, but that means that you can get too comfortable with your information food patch. You can miss flaws that someone who is truly foraging for information, instead of cultivating it, wouldn't miss. Luckily, or unluckily depending on your point of view, we aren't alone. Millions of people use Wikipedia as their go-to, and by and large, that's deserved. Wikipedia is a great place for general knowledge, but it's not perfect, and like other sites, can create information bubbles. Humans are habitual. It's almost inevitable we'll find a place that has the exact type of information our brains want, and that place will get incorporated into our habits. Sometimes massive site conglomerates help with their algorithms, but that just effectively creates more personalized patches that only overlap with other people's patches. Like all the staff on this video cultivated our access to a PBS Idea channel. Not inherently a bad thing. But if you rely on these sources too heavily, you can fall into an echo chamber. These are cases where our meta information is, in some way, wrong. Our brains got ahead of themselves, thinking a place was full of all the tasty tidbits we could want, when it wasn't. That doesn't mean that site or community is bad, not by any means, just that it's insufficient. We don't have a suitably diverse set of patches, we're going to end up nutrient deprived, which is to say we need to confirm what we hear, even from something we implicitly trust. In this day and age, when the world's information is at our fingertips, it's more important than ever to not grow complacent in our mind's habits. It's all out there, we just need to go out and forage for it. But what do you think? Is optimal foraging theory enough to explain our behavior online? Does the internet allow for information foraging in a way that isn't possible in the outside world? And how does information overload factor into all this? Let us know in the comments. Hi there from the Idea Project team. As always, we are a completely open source community trying to continue what Idea Channel started. If you'd like to get involved, all the ways that you can contact with us to join the team are down in the doobly-doo. Thanks for watching.